right, as many of you already know, we're in a series going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. Last week, we were in chapter 7, looking at how Jesus is worthy of even greater honor, greater than Melchizedek, greater than the Levitical line of priests, greater than Father Abraham, greater than Moses. Jesus is above all of them. They were all former shadows or like the passing of time. All their lives only stood as shadows of the real deal. Imperfect pictures of what the perfect one would be. He's worthy of every honor that we can give him with our lives. He has the greater throne. As we saw in verse 24 and 25 in chapter 7, it says this, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is able to completely save those who come to God through him because he lives forever and is always interceding for us. We are anchored to the throne. We are represented before the throne. We are covered at the throne of God in heaven because of Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at the first few verses in chapter 8 and the throne and how because of Jesus, we get the superior covenant and promises of God. That's the title message of this. The message this morning is the superior promise. Would you pray with me as we get into the word? Father God, we thank you so much for all that you're doing here at the church. We thank you, God, for all that you've done in our lives. We ask that you would continue to speak to us and lead us and guide us into everything that you have, Lord, that we would be your people, that you would be our God, that we would be obedient to you, Lord, that we would understand you and your kingdom, Lord. Give us greater insight into your word, understanding, Jesus. We look for greater clarity. We ask that you would be with us. Give us ears to hear. Uh, Yeah, Lord, we ask that you would just give us minds to understand, and yes, Lord, hearts to fully accept who you are. We ask that's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me first start by reading Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. It says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. That is the word of the Lord. The message title this morning is the superior promise. As our passage this morning states, Jesus has given the superior covenant. It means promise. We are no longer bound to the old covenant and the works of the law of Moses like some are wanting to reinstate even now. If you follow prophecy stuff just in the last couple weeks, there's been a ton of excitement and news surrounding the the, the third temple, hasn't there? Uh, If you follow that kind of stuff, you see that there's red heifers and trains to the temple mount. It's kind of crazy. And it has massive end times significance because Jesus said the rebuilt temple would be the place where the Antichrist would stand and declare himself as God. Well, as we'll see, even in our text this morning, this is all connected here. In order for all of these things to happen, there would have to be a temple. And that's what Jesus talked about. And that's precisely what the Jews intend to do as soon as possible. They want to rebuild the temple, the third temple, that was previously torn down in 70 AD for the reason and purpose of reinstating the temple worship and offering sin sacrifices on behalf of the people once again. That's what Hebrews has been all about. Even when they rebuild and reinstate that sacrificial system, Jesus said when he was on the cross, it is finished. There's no more power in that system. He came and fulfilled it. There's no more covering or forgiveness in the blood of those animals. 
Forgiveness is only found in the blood covering of Jesus and him alone. And that's why this is so important for us. Well, for the Jews, they don't believe in that. And so they are adamant and determined to reinstate the temple. And some of the news recently involved, like I said, red heifers and a train system that will take you from Ben Gurion Airport and take you directly to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, going back to the heifer, that's important because in order to meet the requirements of the Old Testament law, a red heifer was needed to accomplish the purification of the Israelites from uncleanness. Specifically, the ashes of a red heifer were needed, and that's in Numbers chapter 19. You see, red heifer ashes are necessary for the purification rites held at the temple. And so many have regarded the appearance of these five red heifers that arrived in Jerusalem as heralding the construction of the third temple. And for us, the important is, is the return of Christ. You see, the implications are huge. For a red heifer to be considered for those rituals, there are almost impossible requirements necessary for them to be holy or kosher. They, like for instance, they can't have more than two hairs on their entire bodies that aren't red. They can't have one scar or wound. They can't have been used by any kind of equipment. You see, they have to be perfect. The right age, the right color, the right size, the, everything. Everything down to what is necessary for these is, is important. So the question is, what are the odds of something like that actually happening? You know, you you got wild animals roaming around in fields and you have to have a perfect animal with no more than two hairs on their entire body that isn't red? Only God could do that, right? Well, Jerusalem just received five of those cows. Not one, but five of those cows. They have a lifespan. And so it's the intention of the Jerusalem Temple Authority to reinstate the temple worship before these cows expire. You see, it's happening right now. Every bit of the temple is ready right now. Every bit of it is ready to be rebuilt right now. We've got plans and, you know, they're going to start construction on a, on a, a train system that takes you from the airport to the temple Not the temple mount, to the temple, they're saying. The point for us this morning is that Jesus is closer now than ever before. But the system that the writer of Hebrews has been so adamant in teaching against is being resurrected and reinstated right now as we speak. For us, we need to recognize and understand that our new covenant in Jesus is superior You see, he's the only way to heaven. And I believe what's going to happen is even Christians are going to want to, you know, give themselves over to that kind of temple worship. Well, look, this is something tangible that we can do. This is something that's here and now that we can do. And Jesus said, no, 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 listen, it's in my blood. What I have done is greater and superior. So for us this morning, we have to understand these covenant promises. A covenant is defined as an agreement enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform a specific action. That's the definition. It's an oath and a promise. This is what I will do. Jesus said the old covenant was fulfilled, finished, and so he instituted a new promise to his people. This is what I will do now. But there's a problem with our definition of covenant. You see, when it comes to God making a covenant with man, In our case, the terms of the covenant are not mutually decided upon. God doesn't negotiate with anyone as to the terms of his promise. He comes to us and offers a covenant relationship with the terms already decided. The new and superior promise Jesus offers is the actual remission or cancellation of sins so God could live within his people forever. There was no need for mutual agreement. In fact, prior to Jesus, we couldn't agree even if we wanted to because the Bible says we were dead in our sins and trespasses. The great news for us is that while we were still sinners, God enacted his new covenant and promise with his people. It's that excellent new covenant which chapters 8 through 10 of Hebrews now expands on. What we see here in the first six verses is really twofold. We see the true throne and tabernacle, the one that will never cease. And we see the greater or superior covenant to the people of God. 
And so let's look at the first point this morning. It's number one, the true throne and tabernacle. I'm going to read Hebrews 8, 1 through 5 again. It says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one, talking about Jesus, to also have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. Now, we need to remember that this was written to the Hebrew Christians in or around 68 to 70 AD. That means the second temple was still intact, and that's why it states this in the present tense. There were priests at that time still offering gifts and sacrifices. However, what we see in verse 5 is that even then, even then, verse 5, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build their tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. We see the throne of God and the true tabernacle built not by man. Everything we have seen in terms of what the Bible says is just an imitation of the real deal. When we get to heaven, there will be another temple or tabernacle, a throne in which we will worship. The Bible says that it will be God himself. He is the holy place. When Moses came up with what the temple would look like and be, he didn't come up with it on his own, just out of his mind, out of fantasy. He modeled it after what he was shown by the Lord, by the Spirit of God. And verse 5 just said that. And then the second half of verse 5, it says, This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And that's flashback to when Moses was given the Ten Commandments and he was, you know, communing with God on the mountain. The priests of old and those, uh, what we look at, Going back, what we look at, even Solomon's temple, in all of its glory, you see it failed and couldn't truly represent the true throne and tabernacle of God. These things on earth are just copies and shadows, and that's what Moses was shown. This is the pattern of which you're supposed to build these things in. And so the priests of old, those who were from the line of Levi and Aaron, they ministered for God in an earthly temple built by man. But it was constrained by time and space. It was in danger of being able to be torn down and destroyed as we saw with the first and second temples. However, Christ's priesthood is superior because he ministers in the true tent, which is set up not by man, but by the Lord, unable to be torn down or destroyed. The earthly tent was only a copy of this heavenly one. So the writer of Hebrews has painstakingly made his arguments about these things in great detail. But now he has come to his main point here in chapter 8, verse 1. Let's look at that one more time. Verse 1 of chapter 8. He says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest, which was what we looked at the last couple of chapters. He says, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Everything we've seen about the temple worship and the priests has led up to this essential matter. We now have an infinitely superior high priest and he ministers in heaven itself. The ministry Jesus now offers is as intercessor, not as sacrificer. You see, his sacrificial work was done once and for all. So he's not coming as a sacrificer because he's already done that. He's now coming as an intercessor. His present work even now isn't to sacrifice for us, but to pray for us. And that he does, as we have seen. You see, you got to think of the, the... Priests, even now, they're going to start offering one of their main jobs is to offer sin sacrifices for the people. But there's no power in that blood. It's only in the blood of Jesus. And so Jesus says, I've come and done that once and for all, never again. 
And so whoever believes in my name, whoever confesses and believes, they will be called sons and daughters of the Most High King. You see, that's how, yeah, that's, that's the covering that we now have. And he intercedes for us day and night with compassionate understanding. We serve a compassionate high priest. Do you remember that from previous chapters? The big picture for us this morning, though, I think is similar to the point when we were talking about the spiritual realm reality several weeks ago and how angels are real beings. They're not fictitious and far off, but actual beings doing the work of God even today. Well, the same point is true when we talk about the true throne and tabernacle of heaven. The most natural reading of the text is that our writer here refers simply to the eternal or heavenly realm where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. It's here that Christ serves as our minister. Where is here? It's in heaven, the heavenly realms. It's an actual, factual place. It's not a fairy tale or folklore passed down from generation to generation. You see, like stories of old told to terrify children and and keep them in line. No, this is a very real city, a very real empire, and a very real place where God dwells with his holy saints. There are walls and buildings, and as Jesus has said, rooms that he's built for us. Remember that? He says, to all who believe, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. You see, so he's doing this right now. The problem with our culture is that we see movies like the new Thor movie called Love and Thunder. How many of you guys have seen that? Raise of hands. I, I just, I saw it. I watched it, you know, curious. And, you know, it's all, oh, everybody's, you know, nobody wants to watch it because it's all woke or whatever. But, but listen, we see movies like the new Thor movie, Love and Thunder. And in that movie, you see this city of omnipotence where Zeus is. And it's like, you know, he's on this high throne and it's beautiful and it's gold. And then these people sneak in, which is like, you know, okay, yeah, they can sneak into heaven. And then they, you know, kill Zeus with like a thunderbolt. So it's just wild. But for most people, we think of that and it's like, oh, well, that's a nice thought. How beautiful, right? How cool it would would be to go to a place like that. But let me tell you, none of our depictions or paintings or movies or art could ever come close to what this place actually is. All we can do is have shadows and copies of what it is. And that's what we're talking about here in chapter 8. Now the main point of what we are saying, verse 1, is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? It says, in heaven. In heaven, verse 1. Then verse 2, it says, And who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. It's in heaven. Jesus, the Bible says, will be the temple and the tabernacle. You see, the people of God won't have to come into a building for the Holy of Holies. We will come to Christ himself. No need for a sun for light because the Son of God is the light. He dwells in heaven. It's an actual place. I think one of the major issues that we face as a people is how terrified we are when it comes to the heavenly realm. I've spoken with people over the years who don't even like to talk about eternity because it freaks them out. Some of you here this morning might even be in that same boat and that, listen, that's okay. It's okay. I get it. I remember I was terrified of the thought of death and eternity. Even as a Christian, I was terrified It was such a terrifying thought that I would even pray that God would keep me here so I could continue to serve him, like I could earn my spot or something, right? Like, let me stay here, Lord, and I'll serve you. I'm so sorry. Well, if I'm honest, I I felt that way because I had no idea, no concept of what the kingdom of God truly is. My fear went beyond a godly fear to an ungodly fear. Fear of leaving this place and my stuff and my people. You guys know what I'm talking about, anybody? It was because I didn't understand eternity. I've heard people preach hellfire and brimstone to those who don't obey God and how terrifying it is to fall into the hands of an angry God, right? Anybody read that book? Or we've seen movies like Left Behind and get all worked up about doing or not doing the right things and getting left behind. And that's, that's terrifying. That's terrifying, man. I mean, I remember liking those movies, but now that I look at them, it's just like, man, it's just... For me, it just serves to terrify people, right? For most people, I found it to be the same way for them, though. 
as we've been talking to couples and meeting with people, this is a fear across the board. But if you dig into that fear, it's not a godly fear. It's a fear based on unknown or it's a fear based on loss. We don't want to leave the earth and people are scared to die. People don't want to miss out on things here and now. How many of you guys have heard of the term FOMO? It's fear of missing out. You know, these people have a fear of missing out. Like, well, we don't know what heaven is, but I don't want to miss out on things here. I believe it's because we don't fully comprehend the kingdom of God. I'm not saying that I do comprehend it, because even now it's mysterious to me. I'm not saying that we can even fully comprehend it on this side of eternity, because it's this thing that we just, our human minds can't wrap around fully, completely. But to better understand, we have to study and know what the good book says about it. And so doing that for me helped alleviate fears and anxieties I had about eternity in heaven. I think one of the problems is that we are more attached to the things around us, to this world, than we are of Jesus. But when you understand, when you understand who he is, when you understand heaven, when you understand eternity, or better understand the kingdom of God, and who he is, and what he does for us, you see, it's not an angry God. It's a compassionate and, and loving, kind God that leads us deeper into himself. We are covered and represented, not hopeless and getting left behind. Verse 3 of chapter 8 It says, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one, Jesus, also to have something to offer. Now, who does he offer the great sacrifice for? Who are the gifts and sacrifices that he offers for? It's you and me. You see, what does he do in heaven? He covers us so that we can live free and without fear in his presence forever. And then like like we saw with Paul, to live is what? Christ, but to die is gain. It's gain. It's not loss. It's gain. We don't lose anything coming to in, in, into eternity. We gain immortality and life. It's better. It's greater. It's far superior. Now, do you, how many of you remember when Jesus was tempted in the desert after he was baptized? Anybody? You guys remember the story? Well, just before he went out into the desert, he, he went to be baptized. And it's where God opened the heavens and poured out his spirit like a dove on Jesus and audibly said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you remember that? Well, as Jesus went out in the wilderness after baptism to be tempted, you see, Satan shows up to him and offers him all kinds of stuff, right? Well, in Matthew chapter four, it comes to a boiling point and Satan keeps tempting Jesus with different things. And then he says this, it's Matthew chapter four, verse eight. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. Here's every good and pleasing thing the world has to offer. Here's everything you could ever want or desire. I give it to you. You want kids? It's like our baby dedication this morning. Kids are a treasure, right? You want kids? You can have them. Money? You can have it all. Fame? It's yours. You want the American dream? Marriage and house and kids and job and toys and and prominence? I'm about to touch some people in the room this morning, I think, right? Satan said, done. All the kingdoms and all their splendor. Think about that. All the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor, you can have them all. But what did Jesus respond with? Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus understands. He understood and knew intrinsically what the outcome of this world would be. This world and these systems won't last forever. What we know and how we live right now will one day come to an end. The American way, listen, it won't last for eternity, you guys. It's not going to last. It has to end. It will end. According to scripture, it's going to end. The things that are good and redeemable and God-honoring, those things will continue, but the system won't. 
I assure you, you won't see any flags in heaven except the banner of Christ. You're not going to see old glory flying. But for the Christians, we come to the realization and the recognition that we don't live for the things of this earth. To live on this planet and in in this country and in this state and in these towns, we are just foreigners and sojourners. Our eternal forever home isn't here. Guess what, you guys? The house that you love and cherish, it wasn't built to last hundreds of years. I used to do underground construction. I know. They just slap these things together. We think, oh man, no, it's my house. It's my abode. It's my place. And I'm going to put all my money into it. And but it's, it's going to end. Moths and rust and termites and earthquakes. And as some up here in Oak Glen just saw firsthand disaster with mudslides and rain can and will make them all go away eventually. How we live and the world's systems have to change in order for Jesus to come back. The point is what we're living for isn't found on earth. We live now for eternity because of what Christ has done for us. What we do in life echoes in eternity. You guys remember that? Right here and now, we're just shadows and dust. Any of you like the gladiator movies, you know, uh, Maximus, you know, uh, and his handler, he just says, we're nothing but shadows and dust, Maximus. Shadows and dust. (laughs) It's one of my favorite lines. But that's here, but we live for eternity. 1 John 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Listen, church, this is is hard for some of us. But everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. Now listen, I'm not saying your love of family and your care for the things God has entrusted to you, like your homes and stuff, is bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying in light of the things which will never fade or break or die, in light of heaven and our forever homes, these things here on earth need to be held with open hands and not closed fists. Don't death grip the things of the earth because it'll kill you. We need to death grip onto Jesus. Listen, this is what I want you to do right now. I want you to just stretch out your hands and open them. Open them like you're going to receive a plate. And just say, it's all yours, Jesus. Repeat it right now with me. It's all yours, Jesus. One more time. It's all yours, Jesus. That's the kind of open-handed heart that we're to have with everything that God brings. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord forever. And that's how we're supposed to operate in our lives. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship God and serve him only by loving your kids. Worship God and love him only by loving your neighbors, by making the most of every opportunity, by being a good steward of the temporary things he's entrusted to us. But don't forget that these things are just that. They're just temporary. We need to be anxiously awaiting heaven and not more things here on earth. Hebrews 8 is talking about something that is fact that we in our American culture don't really talk about, which is life after death. You guys, what we have because of Jesus is superior to anything ever offered to anyone ever before. His promise of life to those who believe is everything. I mean, are you kidding me? Heaven? Eternity with the Creator? Our human minds can't even comprehend the fullness that it'll be. Streets of gold? Gates coming into the city made of pearl? Are you kidding? Mountains of clear gems? I want to to read this for us this morning. I'm going to read several uh, verses out of Revelation 21. And this is a description of heaven. And I know that even in this description, our minds can't fully comprehend it. But here's what I want you to do this morning. If you're with me, you know, if you're listening, okay, listen. Look at me. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And I want you to picture this as I read it. Uh, Try to imagine what, what this is describing. Try to get a picture in your mind. I know that we can't fully comprehend, but try to get the picture of what our hope is, okay? Our hope is Christ, but our hope is for eternity, right? For living with him forever. And this is our home. Listen, close your eyes. 
picture this. Verse 9, Revelation 21. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, can you picture this mighty mountain? And then it says this, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had great high walls with twelve gates, and the twelve gates had angels at each gate, and on the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. Just imagine that 12 foundations built up and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And then jump down to verse 17. It says, The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. This baby is thick, okay? It says the wall, listen, imagine, the wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby. Imagine the beautiful red ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The 12 gates then were also 12 pearls. Listen, imagine this. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great city, the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Just imagine. And then in 21, it says, I did not see a temple in the city. This is what I was talking about earlier. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon or to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Church, look at me. That's our home. Isn't that incredible? In heaven, our eternity, we see the true throne and tabernacle of God. It's our destination and our goal. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus says the only way is to confess his name and then to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And it says you will be written in the Lamb's book of life. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. He's the superior one. He's the tabernacle and at his feet is the throne. So Jesus came and you see he made a better way uh, by offering a greater sacrifice, giving us point number two, the superior covenant. Let's look at this quickly in verse six of Hebrews chapter eight. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. We're going to cover this in even greater detail next week, but I still wanted to briefly touch on it for us today as well. You see, the old covenant was full of laws and regulations and must do's in order to be forgiven. It was also understood that to disobey even one law, you would be in judgment as if you had broken all the laws. And part of the old covenant was that you had to bring one of your best animals, an unblemished, perfect animal that you had raised from birth so that the priests could slaughter it and the blood of that animal would cover you and your family's sins. Can you imagine that? Raising an animal to perfection and then bringing it to a temple and watching as the the priests cut it open and bled it out for you, that was the covering needed to justify people, and that's how forgiveness would come. But the problem is that those animals weren't enough to do it once and for all. They were a temporary and therefore imperfect way of covering sins. It could never have been permanent. The animals weren't great enough. Aren't you glad we don't have to toil and do 
like that anymore. Like I said, we're going to cover this in great detail next week, but the old covenant said, do this and do that. Do this and do that. It was required of the people. But do you know what the new and superior promise does for us? Six times in verse 8 to 13, God says, I will, not you, not you must. He says, I will. You see, that is grace. The old covenant was a yoke of bondage demanding perfect obedience, but the new covenant emphasizes what God will do for his people, not what they must do for him. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he set us free? It wouldn't work and couldn't work if God simply took away the copies and shadows. It's If he simply did away with the old covenant and didn't replace it with a superior one, we would be without hope. The old was temporary and ineffective to cover his people forever, That was until Jesus came. Listen, I know the unknown is scary. I know that talking about end times and eternity can be hard. And that heaven is a foreign concept to most of us. But church, listen, it's not on us anymore. Eternity is given by Jesus. Our job is to repent and believe. The promise is superior. Now we have a hope in him and him alone. So let me close with this as the band comes back up in Hebrews 8 verse 6 it says but Jesus these words introduce the prospect of a completely different kind of relationship something dramatically new has happened in Christ the writer shows that even in Old Testament times the covenant which God made with his people was regarded as a purely temporary agreement not so with us The promise of Jesus of heaven is a surety, not a question. Our new covenant is superior in every way to everything that's come before him. Not temporary, but eternal. Meaning if you've given your life to Jesus, you have nothing to fear any longer. So listen, if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do that today. Confess and believe. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Our time here is short. Even if we live another 80 years, it's short in comparison to eternity. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. What we need is to be forgiven once and for all. And that promise only comes through believing in Jesus. And so if you're here, you're listening, and you've never fully surrendered your life to Christ, I'd encourage you to do that today, right where you are. As I'm going to pray in just a moment, I want you to do some work with the Lord and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. I confess that you are Lord. I believe, Lord, that you are who you say you are. Would you come in and transform my life? And guess what, church? He does and he will. And not only does he here and now, but he will, uh, sh- he will secure you an eternity in heaven forever. And that's to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. So though we can and should enjoy the things of the world God has given us, our hearts shouldn't be set on them because Christ is our all in all. He is the one we cling to. So would you pray with me as the band leads us in another song of worship? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for the surety of of salvation, Lord, that we can have in you. I pray for anybody that's here this morning or listening online that has never given their life to you, Lord, that they would spend time with you right now in these moments, that they would spend time with you, God, and that you would show up in their life in a very real way. Holy Spirit, that you would endo these words with great power to do the work that you intend to do in your people. Lord, I pray that you would be calling these prodigals home. You would be calling these people back to your throne of grace and that you would do an incredible and mighty work in them. God, you are so mighty and we love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's worship together.